So here's a scenario. On that day, that is the day that Stephen was stoned for his Christian faith, and it's really rather good sermon in front of the Sanhedrin. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, and going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Oh, better be quiet. Better leave it there. Shh, shh, shh. Keep your head down for a bit. Hmm. Well, those who'd been scattered, verse 4 of Acts 8, preached the word wherever they went. They did not go back at that point. This was compatible with their expectation of what was going to happen. They did not pull back at that point. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria. For goodness sake, Samaria. Samaria? And he proclaimed the Christ there. He didn't put out fields to see whether he would be welcomed. He didn't put out feelers to see if there was anybody around him sort of work with him and possibly could work with the authorities or something of that sort. Perhaps the council would like him to come and do such and such. If not this, then possibly that. He just went down to Samaria of all places and proclaimed Christ there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. But they all got very mad. They all get very, you know, I mean, this is not what we want happening in church. Shrieks in church. Shrieks, evil spirits come out of many. Paralytics and cripples healed. You can't have that going on. So there was great joy in that city. Oh, there was great joy in that city. But believe me, that's really not all there was. Death, mourning, scattering, prison, men, women, all dragged off. And then, down to Samaria. Not us old people. Look at the behaviour church. Philip went down to Samaria. Philip, one of those seven Hellenistic Jews elected to in the church in Acts 6, he's been martyred. Philip, therefore, another member of that same seven, undertakes a mission to Samaria on his behalf. One man drops, another man fills his place. I love that. Something in me sort of loves that sort of, yes, you know, one man drops, another man steps forward. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different thing in practice, isn't it? What do you think Philip's wife said to him about it? <laughs> you crazy Sorry, but what do you think? You know? This is the practical outworking of this deal, okay? She's going to give him jibbo. I mean, what happened to Paul's wife? When Paul was ultimately converted in chapter 9 later on, what happened to her? She disappears off the scene pretty rapidly. Gone. Deserted. Bad enough. Oh, no. You're on your own, show. There's all sorts of speculation in the commentaries because they've got to fill the page about which possible cities these were, but Luke doesn't tell us. We do know he was in Samaria. And we do know a bit about the situation in Samaria. Syncretism is where you mash up your religion altogether. There's a great deal of that going on beginning in the UK at the moment. Mashing up biblical faith with the belief of the society around us. Making it a different thing rather than a biblical thing of Christianity. And there was syncretism, there was mixed race problems of the post-Assyrian exile in Samaria. There was all sorts of hassle going on between Mount Geritzim and Jerusalem worship centres in between the two testaments. There was heightened prejudice and animosity between Jews and Samaritans. The best that could be said for their relations in the first century was John 4, 9. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Because they're probably punch up. So Philip went down to them. And Philip preached there. Good man. He's expected to get a paste in. Any reasonable, rational person going to a bunch of Samaritans and telling them about Jesus was expected to punch in the face. At least. And instead of the Davidic Messiah, their, their expectation, they were looking forward to the coming of the Taheb, the Restorer, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. They had this parallel view. A herald of the last day. Day of final judgment, of vengeance. Where the temple of Gerizim would be restored and the sacrifices are reinstated and people come to see things their way. Philip preaches them. The Christ in whose person the kingdom of God has come. You've got to tell them they're wrong. The Christ by whose name it spreads. And God accompanies this, this announcement with signs of healing. You can see that through Acts. Acts 4, 16, 22, 30. Acts 5, 12. Acts 6, 8. Interestingly, signs are only mentioned two more times after this in Acts. Acts 14.3, Acts 15.12.
whether that's because it's just going on all the time and it gets monotonous mentioning it, or what, I don't know. Or whether it's the fact that as things become more established and more credible, God is no longer accrediting his, his word in that way. I don't know. But in enemy territory where false worship is practiced, Philip goes in there and encounters the spiritual powers behind this occult worship. And evil spirits are thrown out of people. They're taking it on. God in his mercy does signs of his kingdom advancing in syncretistic Samaria. Granting release through the herald of this liberating gospel. And tokens of the, the coming messianic age from Isaiah 35, 3 and 6 are done. As Philip heals the paralysed and the lame. doesn't say he was all of them, it says he was some of them. That's important. Now why do the people pay close attention? Why do they pay close attention? But you can see the pressure and the tension and the, the intensity of what's going on. The guy stuck his head in a noose. And then when God comes forward in that situation. Now we all want God to come forward in our situation. We all want God to prove himself mighty in clan dialogue. Do we not? I mean, he'll give it unsettling, but he'll be rather good. The trouble is, he tends to do it in particular contexts. And contexts like the one I've been describing with Philip already. And that's the difficulty. Philip per proclaimed the Christ there. What's the response of the crowds? Verses 6 to 8. We're talking today about the expectations of response that we have when we undertake intentional evangelism. We've got to bear with the fact that, generally, it gets a bit hairy. Generally, there's a cost. Generally, sacrifice is involved. Biblically. And it can happen. The response of the crowds, though, when Philip sticks his head in his house, goes out on his limb. They heard it. They heard him. Now the problem we've got here in Wales today is getting heard, isn't it? Because people have got fingers in their ears like this. Have you seen this? Well, it's not quite like this, but it might as well be. Right? They're walking down the street like this because they think they've heard it, and it's rubbish. Because what they've heard is rubbish. What they've heard is rubbish twice. Firstly, it's rubbish to them, and secondly, it's rubbish as far as God and his word is concerned. So they've switched off. The fingers are in the ears. No more listening. But these people, seeing what they saw, that's a Jewish guy coming down here. Didn't he realise we could, you know, knock ten bells out of him? What's he coming here for? This must be important. What's this all about? We'll have some fun here. And then they start hearing and seeing what God is doing. And they more than hear. Now please notice, first of all, in this account, the privacy admission at the human level is verbal communication, is given to verbal communication. Bringing people to the awareness of truth that leads to salvation and following Christ. Words aren't used. Did I say this last time? It was a couple of weeks ago. It's not preach the gospel if necessary, use words. Right? That, that biblically is nonsense. Right? Absolute nonsense. Fine sounding sound, but rubbish theology. Do be careful of this. Do be careful of Twitter. Do be careful of people saying, you know, godly things on Twitter. Because very often, a great soundbite is very bad theology when you actually think about it. Do think about it, but do think about it. Truth. Preaching the Christ. Words are used. When Christ is communicated, words are used. Now there's, there's all sorts of backing up that has to be done in terms of consistency of life. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you can't get away from the primacy of the preached word and the written word in reaching out and communicating Christ to people. Words are used. This is the shocking bit. I find this amazing. I don't expect this. People listened? I don't expect that to happen. Do you expect that to happen? Yeah, I mean, how odd. You know, he got up and preached. And they listened. <coughs> They're pagans. They're Samaritans. They got this guy Simon, you know? Simon, the, the great power who's whatever, the magic powers, occult stuff going on the street. And old Philip goes down there. And there's nothing clever to start with. He stands up and he says, uh, You need to know about Jesus. Please. Repent. Trust Christ. Who would believe that? It is just humanly so unlikely. We tend not to expect this. Because actually, what you really need is, is, is really very cool music in church. Yeah? I feel about none. Well, what we need is really influential people, politicians or sports people or something, to endorse Christianity and give interviews and support campaigns. Philip had none. What we need is to make Christianity look really cool and laid back. How's my hair? 
unexceptional and, and unexceptionable. The two go together. If there's nothing to take exception to, it's unexceptional. Mm. Philip wasn't inoffensive. He went down to a dodgy place and a really dodgy bunch of people and he preached Christ himself to those people. Christ himself. Not church, not religion, not our way of doing things. He preached Christ himself to those people, it says. He preached that Jesus is the Messiah. Against their belief and expectation of the Tahir. And by the mercy of God, these people listened to him. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. Sometimes, stunningly, even in Clan Bay Law, you can be standing outside Kebab House on a Friday night having a chat with a few people, and people start listening and chatting, and they start to listen, and young people on a Friday night outside the Kebab House listen to what you've got to say about Jesus. That's odd, isn't it? Who do you expect that? But of course, it takes being ready to do that, and to take the risk of that, because it could be embarrassing. They may not show us the sort of respect that biblically we know we don't deserve, but that we've culturally come to expect to be shown to us. They heard Philip, they listened, yeah, and they saw the signs. If he's going to first and foremost make it his business to preach the Christ to these guys, Philip is going to do it the way Jesus did it, and it's risky. Right, we're going to pray about that. How long have you been in this situation? That ain't great. Let's pray about it. I don't know what's going to happen. I've got no idea. It's up to God what happens. But we're going to pray about it. Oh, that's scary. Oh, that's risky. But this gospel is good news to these people. And Philip believes that. And Philip, under God, makes good news of that gospel to them. And of course, there are those in our also secular Western evangelical culture who feel uneasy with all this and insist that it is the nature of his first time advance of the gospel across the cultural threshold into Samaria that primarily accounts for these signs being done. Okay. But the fact that Philip faces a situation of spiritual encounter, not unlike what pioneer church planters among unreached peoples face today, that should encourage us to expect the powerful work of the gospel in such situations as well, where you're crossing cultural barriers for the first time to unreached people, Surely. And the people of Wales are for the most part misinformed about Christ and therefore they put themselves beyond reach and are unreached. Are unreached. In practical terms, in functional terms, our people are worse than unreached because they think they've been reached and they quite rightly reject what they've been reached with because it's wrong. And it's not what Christ is about at all. It's a bit of a challenge to our willingness to encounter people's actual problems and say, look, I'm going to pray for you. Is that okay? Let's pray about it. Don't know, I'm going to see what God will do. No guarantee. It's okay. Who knows? But he cares. Well, Simon is described by Luke as practicing magical arts. And he's described by Luke as having, you know, some success, big following. He's presented himself as the embodiment of the occult power. He receives praise as if he was some sort of angelic or divine supernatural being. They say, this is, this is the power of God, the power that is called great. But the arrival of the gospel in this city has put that magician or whatever he is, that occult practitioner Simon, in a very awkward position because the gospel challenges the established religious system. You know, we, we might tend to think, well, let's, let's go for the, those who are at least church people. You know, let's have the soft underbelly. At least they hope, we hope they're going to be respectful. Ah, oh, forget that. But we hope they will. Uh, and, uh, you know, no, 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 no. Simon has to come on the same basis that everybody else has to come to Philip's preaching, to Philip's gospel. On the basis of repentance and faith. And the first thing these Samaritans have learned was that the gospel's power is superior to the magic of a person like Simon the sorcerer. Okay, they saw the signs, they all saw the signs, and the people paid close attention. You know Simon actually goes and gets baptised, but it's a bit skinny. It's that emphasis on credible signs that follow the primary preaching of the word that Luke, who wrote that, shows for us. 
authenticating Philip's gospel preaching. The message is there, but it's real. And we pray for people, and so on and so forth. Apostolic practice was to preach, primarily, and then to authenticate the message with clear manifestation of, not just testimony to, but manifestation of, in their case, the works of the Messiah. Now, are we sure? Well, the whole point is for us to follow Jesus, right? So, in his church founding sermon on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2, this is what Peter preaches. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over by God's set purpose and so on. And you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And how does Jesus of Nazareth go on to be accredited by God to the people of Jerusalem? In the Acts. Peter and John, straight after Acts 2, straight after that sermon, saying repent, believe the gospel. Straight after that, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John healed the crippled beggar at the beautiful gate of the temple. Oh. And in those early days of Jerusalem, this was quickly established as the normal situation. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade, we read. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were handed to the number. As a result, verse 15, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And crowds also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. And what's the next heading in the paragraph? Very, just right after that, after all of them were healed, the very next paragraph heading, the apostles persecuted. See, we want the great preaching, we want the big preaching, we want people coming to Christ, we want the healings. The devil lashes back. Always. Read a bit of Revelation. The tale of the dragon, you know. And the high priest and all his associates who are members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Expect that if you're going to be a faithful Christian witness. Jealousy. And they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. <laughs> Hang on, God's been dealing graciously even yet, because during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts and preach. And what do they do? Oh, no, we've got to back off now, boys, we're off. No, 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 it's a bit hot here. They didn't. They went out to the temple courts and they proclaimed the temple courts. The poor old high priest waking up and having their breakfast that morning, somebody walks in and says, those guys who stuck in jail last night, well, they're out and they're preaching in the temple. What? How did that happen? Hmm. Oh, dear, it's going to get very dicey now. So what's happening in Acts 8, 7? With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. Many. It doesn't say all. It doesn't say those of faith. It doesn't say those of big faith. The proper Christians, the super duper Christians, but it does say many. And it says that these tremendous answers to what must have looked like risky prayers bear a close relationship to the credibility and the authenticity and the effectiveness of Philip's preaching Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. There's nothing wrong, you know, with talking to people about your prayer life as a Christian, people who don't believe. There's nothing wrong with that. They need to hear the message primarily, but they also need to know that we serve a God who does step in, we do believe it. I'm not flogging a dead horse here, am I? I mean, we do all believe that God does stuff, yeah? yeah. Absolutely, that's a relief. I was getting a black blood. Has it been that long? Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't. <laughs> this gospel doesn't just promise good news to the poor. It delivers. And of course, primarily it delivers salvation. But that's not all it delivers. It brings us into a relationship with the living God who is utterly committed to his people. And we know that and we see that. And it's great, isn't it? Doesn't talk about that, people will think we're bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Lord Himself pointing the way that He looks like the uh, biblically biblically promised Messiah Himself. He does this. He's not ashamed to do this. When John heard in prison, Matthew 11, what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And John the Baptist says, oh, hang on, this isn't what I was expecting. Because he had a set of expectations as well. 
And he sent his disciples along to ask, and Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the deaf, dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. And blessed is the man who doesn't fall away, I can to me. Because when our expectations are not exactly met by what God is doing, it's very easy for us to become disappointed, disillusioned, and walk away. Blessed is the man, says Jesus, who does not fall away, I can to me. Here's the Lord himself pointing to the way that he looks like the bit that he promised Messiah, but not the bit of Isaiah that John was reading. And Philip was a follower of the same Messiah, so he goes about preaching that same biblical Messiah, praying for God to accredit Jesus and accredit his ministry in biblical ways. Scary, isn't it? Yes, we're being asked for something a little bit scary. And funny enough, People were really happy about going to Philip's church. That messy lot of pagans down in Samaria, they love going to Philip's church. Great job. You look at that. Who would have thought that? Do you know, something else is really odd. Listening to Philip's sermons was a pleasure to these really unlikely people. Can you imagine that? Oh, I can't invite, I can't invite such and such, I can't invite them along. I can't share my faith with them and bring them to church. Look at it, he goes on for 30 minutes. Can't have that. They won't like that, will they? Depends, doesn't it? How long do you reckon Philip went on for? Do you think he cut it short? I'm going to cut it short. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but do you think he did? I can't believe he did. He was living in better days than these, wasn't he? <laughs> he was living in much better days than these. I had some, I'm going to tell you something. I had some feedback from a, a student setting uh, just, just recently. I'd spoken a while ago. I've been asked to go again. And, uh, there were some young Christians there, and who knows, who knows, who knows what's going on. But uh, I was asked to do something, and they, they didn't tell me not to preach for more than 40 minutes. It was going really well. It was going great. They were back and forth asking questions. They were just sucking truth out of me, you know? And it was like an hour and a bit. And he was there. He was all right with it. It was three hours. It wasn't three hours at all. <laughs> not at all. But, uh, but do you see the point? There are those who are perceiving and those who are picking up. God is at work and God is speaking and God is teaching and God is dealing with hearts and souls and minds and lives. And they love to come and they love to hear. And I'm not making an excuse for going on and preaching on boring sermons. But I am saying, in Philip's situation, it was a joy to those people. Unexpected, unusual people. An unexpected joy. And no doubt if the church in Jerusalem had heard the sermon, they'd have said, oh, stay. There'd be people there saying that. Advising wisdom. And the people were hearing God at work. Bush. It was great joy. Now that really is authentic biblical stuff, isn't it? Because do you remember back at the outset, when the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds by night as they were keeping watch over their flocks and so on and so on, he described right back there what the effect of receiving that coming Messiah was going to be. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Don't back off. Don't back off. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. There's a shock. It's good news? Yes, great. Good news of great joy. Why, church? Yes. And it's going to be for all peoples, even that bunch down in Samaria that Philip's going to go to surely. Because 33 years later, Philip, the Hellenized Greek Jewish believer, goes down to a city in Samaria of all places and intentionally and faithfully preaches that Jesus is the Messiah in that apparently God-forsaken place. And look what happens. <coughs> what God has said was true. And we have these expectations and we think we know how it's going to go. When, when I stand in the mall on a Monday and there's this guy there, I want to stand with you on a Thursday night, you know, talking to that guy down there. You know, straight away, he's in a lot of trouble. And, uh, oh, not, he's an interesting guy. And all of a sudden, so a little bit opens and you go, what? And he goes, yeah, that's the point. Hey, that's great, isn't it? But we expect that to go badly. And therefore we pull back. Biblically, A, we should expect things to turn out biblically. But B, we should not be in the business of pulling back. From Samaritans, from Sandalo, what are Sandalo? Sandalians. No, I don't know what to say. 
And the, the people that we expect most will give us a hostile response. Because, you know, thinking back over the way it's actually worked out across the course of a few decades, Luke John and Olivia the Christian, quite often it's been those people who've given me the initial, most hostile response who've actually come to Christ in the end. Odd, oh, isn't it? Odd. Well, <clears throat> something very odd happens next in this story because um, Peter and John are sent down from Jerusalem to see what on earth Philip is getting up to with that bunch down in Samaria. And of course, Peter and John know very well what the prophecies in the Old Testament say. They know very well what the Lord Jesus said about the Gentiles being brought into salvation on the same basis as the Jews. They know all about that. But it just seems unthinkable that God should have done anything good in Samaria. With Philip. Who, after all, is, is a deacon, not an apostle. And down they go, and there he is, and it's marvellous, it's fantastic. And they, they see it, and they, they pray with these people, and these people are baptized, it's fantastic. But then they perceive that they haven't received the Spirit the way that the Jerusalem church or the Adam on the day of Pentecost. What's happening? The first Gentile church hasn't been included and incorporated. And almost God has held things up, because it's going to take a coming together of Jew and Gentile to form a church of God. It's not to be a Jewish church and a Gentile church, it's to be a together church. And then come the emissaries, and they pray with these people, and God says, yes, now we're right. You're accepting them as your brethren, you're accepting them as your brothers, and from that time on, that doesn't happen. Where the gospel has been fully and properly heard, those days are gone. Jew and Gentile together, in the church of God. Just as the prophet Joel had prophesied, and just the way that Peter himself had actually preached in Acts chapter 2, from Joel chapter 2. And bringing together the people of God in the experience of the Spirit, in response to the intentionally proclaimed gospel by repentance and faith alone, by grace alone. They include the genuine, verses 14 to 7, 17. They curse the counterfeit, verses 18 to 24. They curse the counterfeit. Because so far, Simon is one of those categories in the parable of the soils. He hasn't actually really genuinely turned from sin and trusted Christ. He's not in that position yet. Just bear in mind that actually exposing that which is not authentic is part of preaching that which is authentic. That's all I want to say. Do you see the point? It's not acceptable in, in moral and philosophically relativistic whales at the moment to, to disagree. Let alone say, that is wrong. That is fake. You're a fake. Biblically, that is involved in the process sometimes of intentional evangelism. Just be aware of it without being angular. That is actually what came to be necessary in that situation. Finally, finally, for that. finally, verse 25, here's what happens. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. Not the end of the sentence. Peter and John had deserved a holiday. They were due for a rest. It's been quite intense, let's face it. God has actually just done what he'd said he was going to do and brought in these Gentiles. Whoa, Samaritans. Whoa. They returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Because their lifestyle, their understanding of following Christ works out this way. Because their understanding of discipleship to Christ includes a life that is committed to intentional evangelism. I know that's kind of cultural in our culture. You're supposed to keep everything to yourself. You're supposed to wear a little symbol of Christian. You can have a little symbol, but you can't have a changed lifestyle. Yeah? That's the finding of the European courts in recent weeks, isn't it? You can have your symbol, but you can't have your lifestyle. And part of that lifestyle is actually persuading people to turn to Christ. It's not going to be popular. It's going to cause us problems. But Peter has not just expressed another viewpoint. He's not open in the discussion over alternative approaches to an issue. Peter speaks as an authoritative representative of Christ. And he's used a curse formula against corruption and error. Is, is he addicted to popularity? You know, modern Western evangelicalism is very addicted to popularity. 
read the, read the, the tweets of the big preachers. You know? Look at their Facebook status up there. Looking for popularity. Is Peter addicted to popularity? Well, yes, he is, but popularity with Christ. Is Peter afraid of giving offence? Well, yes, he is, but he's afraid of giving offence to the King of Kings, you know. And if people are to genuinely repent and find Christ, then truth must be spoken out in love. You could have forgiven Peter and John for nipping away quietly for arrest, but they carry on putting their head on the block, aren't they? Up through all the Samaritan villages now. You know, it's like out there in the villages, man. It gets a bit hairy in the villages. You know, <laughs> you live in one over, yeah, okay. But, you know, there's a bit wild out there. And we started running the youth club back in Plan Sabal. One of the local constabulary said to me, You sure? Yes. He said, what do you mean? The hillbillies. <laughs> hillbillies? You're kidding. No, it's great, isn't it? It's not like that at all. But, but that could be the attitude, not for Peter and John. No. They've been involved in preaching in cities. They've had a city-wide campaign. They've been involved in going off through the villages. It's not going to bother them there either. And, and, and shortly, you know, Philip is going to approach an Ethiopian eunuch, a high official at the court of Candace, Queen of Egypt. Not bothered. Not bothered. Don't care who you are. You need to know Jesus, mate. Making a good impression? Mm -mm. Forming French? Well, yes! Forming French? Yes! Influencing French? Yes! You're not here to be Bolsheviks, angular, difficult people. But it's easy then to lose sight, to become addicted to that. And to lose sight of our proper point, purpose, mission and motivation. We're here to be the authoritative but gracious, caring but clear, heralds of the Gospel of Christ. So three words. Final exhortation for us all. Intend. Be intentional. Evangelize. What a horrible word. Mm. Do it. And persist. <laughs>